the power of dreams. I'm Madeline, and I'm thrilled to have you with us today. For those of you that are familiar with Dream Bank, welcome back. And for those of you that this is your first time joining us, welcome. Here at American Family Insurance, we believe communities are stronger and the future is brighter when people are actively pursuing their dreams. That's why we created Dream Bank, an inspirational community destination and digital experience dedicated to dreamers everywhere. From our daily event series to immersive signature programs, there's something for every dreamer. Our always free offerings are designed to help you celebrate the dream journey, overcome obstacles, and stay motivated. Now I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker. Lucia Page is a DEI and B leader recognized for her passion and ability for cultivating work cultures of inclusion and belonging. She has over six years experience leading employee resource groups and over 25 years of experience spanning the disciplines of digital advertising, marketing and communications, and digital transformation. She is currently an IT project manager at Homesite Insurance and leads the women's resource group at her company. All right, take it away, Lucia. All right. Well, hi, everyone. And thank you so much for the warm intro, Madeline. I appreciate Dream Bank's invitation to speak and to all of you for joining today's webinar. As Madeline said, my name is Lucia Page, and I am a diversity, equity, and inclusion practitioner uh, specializing in cultivating inclusive work cultures. Now, I don't study leadership or management academically, but as she said, throughout my career, I've had the privilege of both formally and informally leading teams in both the nonprofit and corporate sectors. My formal background is in communications and digital advertising, and I currently serve as an IT project manager where I'm advancing agile delivery practices at my company. I'm also an experienced business resource group leader, and I'm currently the president of my organization's business resource group for women, which I've led over the past year and a half. So during this time, our women's BRG witnessed a 5x growth in membership, and our members are incredibly engaged. And one of the things that they tell us is that they're gaining new leadership skills, they're making new connections and feeling a greater sense of belonging and connectedness with both one another and our enterprise. So what I am able to see is that we are really making a difference in our colleagues' lives, uh, how they're incorporating this in their work, and I'm really proud of what our group has accomplished. So today's conversation really is going to be uh, from the lens of leadership lessons that I've learned uh, in helping our group to achieve this. So before we get into some of those lessons, I thought it would be helpful to just think about how we define peer leadership. Uh, the word peer, as defined by Merriam Webster, is one that of, of equal standing with another, equal. And a leader, by definition, is a guide or a conductor, uh, someone who leads others and has a commanding authority and influence. So a simple way that you can define peer leadership, or at least the way that I define peer leadership, is that it's a person who can lead, who can influence, and who can draw discretional energy of those around them without having any kind of formal authority over them. So how do peer leaders impact us? Uh, in 2019, uh, a company called Imperative, uh, who focuses on employee connection and team building, did a survey about employee engagement, and their findings suggest that 80% of people learn as much or more from their peers as they do from their managers. And so when I first saw this stat, I was kind of blown away. Uh, but then when I thought about it a little bit more, it actually made a lot of sense to me. Uh, Think about a moment uh, or think for a moment about who you spend most of your time collaborating with. For most of us, I would wager to guess about 85 to 90 percent of our day or of our work week is actually spent engaging with those who fall right around our level. And then beyond that, you may or you may not have a weekly or biweekly, maybe a monthly check in with your direct frontline uh, manager. And then, in fact, another company, Nectar HR, which specializes in employee recognition, uh, states that only 37% of employees report having weekly one-on-ones with their manager. 
And then as you go up the line, uh, the opportunities that you have to meet with your director or your VP progressively shrink down. And then above that, once you get into the C-suite, it's uh, kind of highly unlikely that you'll have occasion for uh, a one-on-one -on -one meeting with someone from the senior leadership team. Uh, you might see them at your all company huddles, but the chance to actually meet with dedicated focus time with them is, is pretty small. Now, granted, this uh, varies by company, by role and industry. Uh, for example, in the startup world, you might have a lot more engagement and exposure to folks in your senior leadership team. But as a whole, uh, it's a pretty relatable scenario for most. Uh, and I did, uh, I did a focus group of one. I actually asked my wife about this the other day, and uh, she is an occupational therapist, and she's worked in the hospital and education sectors. And when I was talking about this with her, uh, she said she could really relate with the scenario. So if we're learning as much or more from our peers as we do our managers, you know, what does this mean? Like, what role do peer leaders serve? Uh, among other things, they are our teachers, our mentors, role model models, motivators, our collaborators and sounding boards, our advocates, and they're our friends. Uh, and that's a lot, right? And that's not even all of the ways that peer leaders serve us. But when you see it laid out like this, is it really any surprise just how influential they can be? Peer leaders set the culture of our organizations, especially as their influence expands. It expands exponentially through all of the people that they work with and impact. And so together, they have a huge impact on our overall employee experience and engagement. Nectar HR, that uh, company that I just re referenced earlier, also found that 46% of employees say that peers have the most impact on their engagement. So in short, our peers, they are energy. Uh, they are both positive and negative energy. And so how do we harness the positive energy uh, how can we use that to lead one another to create great company cultures and inspire one another to do great things? So uh, let's consider what a whole approach to peer leadership might look like. Uh, for me, there are five key traits of a of an effective peer leader who kind of bring who who kind of celebrates this whole approach. They have clarity of vision. Uh, and a clear understanding of their why, of their company's why, and they're able to align the two. They have a sense of humility. Uh, they don't. They know why they. Uh, they know that they don't always have the answers, uh, and they encourage their team to share knowledge and experience uh, so they can learn together. They have a clear sense of ownership and accountability, and they're able to instill this in others. They are strong listeners. They listen more than they talk and they are present when they're with us. And then finally, peer leaders help us to embrace just about everything that comes our way. They are unflappable uh, and they radiate positive energy. So let's dig into this a little bit more. So as I mentioned, uh, leaders understand their company's why. And beyond that, they're able to connect the company's why to their own personal narrative. Now, think about when you start a new job. Many of us are presented with our company's mission and vision statement uh, when we start a new job. And each year, you know, we might get access to our company's annual strategic plan. But then here's the question, and be honest. How many of you review your company's strategic plan and purpose statement on any kind of regular basis? And how often do you then take it a step further and reflect on how the company's purpose aligns with your own? So I ask these questions because personally, uh, for me, this was a game changer. It was a game changer in the way that I brought myself to work. One of the reasons why is that it forced me to be intentional and it really helped me to frame the work that I was doing to a greater purpose beyond just making money for an organization or getting the next sale. Second, it 
helps to it helps to keep me grounded and focused. Um, and this is something that's really critical when you are faced with ambiguity and constant change. I don't know about you, but for some folks, uh, you know, when change is happening all the time, you get a bit of, of change fatigue. And so staying grounded on the why and your own why and being able to align that really helps to harden your change resilience muscle. It also helps me to think about the work that we're doing on a holistic level, meaning what we are doing when we're solving problems and finding solutions, it's not just about the impact to our immediate team. It's how that work uh, spreads out and impacts other teams, how it impacts our customer customers, and it, how it impacts our broader community. So what do you do with this? Uh, so here are a few things to consider. And the first is this. If you don't have a copy of your company's annual strategic plan, I highly recommend getting a copy uh, and making sure that you read through it. Now, you don't have to memorize it, but I do uh, recommend that you keep a copy of that, of that strategic plan on your desk and that you revisit it at least on a monthly basis. When I was in advertising, we actually used to say that it took at least 25 interactions before the message actually re reached the people that we were trying to connect with and uh, even more for that message to actually start to sink in. And so this is a similar type of concept. Repetition is key. Uh, and it, it's key until it becomes a natural part of the conversation uh, and it's really ingrained in your daily work. And the idea behind some of this is that you really wanna be able to speak to that why um, and you wanna be able to do it in your own words uh, because once you've internalized that why piece, you can really draw on it for strength. When people are looking to you for leadership, when you know, you're helping folks and giving them some motivation, or when you're collaborating with others on a big project, and maybe there are a lot of competing thoughts, uh, ideas, uh, recommendations, and sometimes they may not always necessarily stay aligned. So keeping that why can help you be focused in that conversation so that you can find the right solution for the right time. So an example of this in motion or, you know, how you can see that play out is um, think about a project that maybe you're working. I'll just pretend that it's software development and like you got put on this really big project. You've been, you know, working for the last six months or so to, to get this project out the door and it's just about ready to release and go to market when suddenly you find out that the business needs have changed and business has deprioritized that work and your project essentially gets defunded and shut down, right? Pivots happen. Um, that's just the constant nature of, uh, of work. And how many of us have been through that? I mean, I know that that has happened to me a number of times. And oh man, you know, if if you are not really centered on the why, it can be a really demoralizing experience. But again, if you keep your company's strategic plan and purpose statement and, you know, interconnect those whys, uh, you can reframe what just happened uh, and uh, take that energy and convert it to positive energy um, and be able to see, hey, this decision, it's not a personal decision. Uh, it's very frustrating and we're naming that. Um, but the reason that we're doing this is just uh, so that we are better able to serve our customers in the broader community, right? It's a, it's a shifting the way that we're thinking about it. And so I, I do wanna be clear, um, this is not about being toxically positive, right? It, it still stinks to do all that work only to find out that something gets shelved uh, for a later date or doesn't see the light of day. But again, that why piece of it helps you to convert that negative energy into something positive and constructive. Uh, the other thing is, you know, using the why allows you to apply it towards your team, your departments, um, and your, your peers, uh, the, their mission and vision statement for their groups. And, uh, and you can uh, apply those to their objectives and key results and, and better understand how, um, how they all interconnect and how your work is interconnected. So for our WBRG, just using that as an example, we have a metric scorecard. And I'm sure you can guess, uh, one of the things that we do is we 
took a copy of our company's strategic goals and plan and kind of our purpose statement, and we slapped it right in our metrics scorecard. And so that way, every time we look at our scorecard, we see it. Um, it keeps it top of mind and it helps us to be really intentional with our planning, uh, again, to ensure that we're remaining aligned. And to be clear, um, we're not necessarily spitting out the strategic plan and purpose statement out verbatim every time we're meeting. But the, the idea behind that is, again, the repetition of this practice creates a foundation for everything that we do. So to, to sum up this first trait, again, understand your company's why, uh, understand your own why, and find a way to um, embrace the two and align them. All right, so let's talk about humility. My favorite leaders are and the ones that I would work for again in a heartbeat or that I would work on a project again in a heartbeat are known for their humility. Humility has a long list of benefits. It promotes hearing all voices and encourages others to embrace inclusion and diversity of thought. It fosters trust. It builds psychological safety because you're making space for others to make mistakes um, and to, to lean on that uh, and, and learn from it. It increases collaboration, making space for innovation and creativity. Uh, it increases morale, right? It helps people see that you know we are more similar than we are uh, dissimilar. It instills a sense of ownership across the team and it helps us to develop authentic relationships. I read an article, it's a great article the other day about the power of humility. And it was written by uh, someone named Megan McCarthy and she uh, is an HRVP. And in her article, she spoke about how, quote, humble leaders inspired more effective teamwork, higher performing leadership teams and stronger coordination around overall goals. And here's an example of this. It's actually a very recent example. So the other day, uh, my company, our enterprise company, uh, held a Pride event in celebration of Pride Month, which uh, happy Pride to everybody. And in the Pride Month, um, they invited folks to tell their coming out stories or experiences um, as an LGBTQ person uh, in the community. And they also invited people who are allies to share their experience of learning how to be an ally and um, how they model that out. And during this, uh, this event, one of our senior leaders spoke about his experience as an ally to the LGBTQ plus community and how he had actually messed up an opportunity to be a true ally. And it was, as he called it, a moment of truth. And it was a, a such a personal, powerful story about how he had messed up uh, and missed the mark big time. And he shared, you know, the lessons that he learned from that experience and, and what he was going to do about it, you know, how he was, how he's, how he's going to approach the, the idea of allyship moving forward. And let me tell you, the chat, it, it, was, a, it was a webinar um, session and the chat just lit up the, the amount of support, um, the, you know, like how that story resonated uh, with folks. I mean, you could just feel the energy and, and certainly you could feel the energy of the other um, folks who, who uh, shared their experiences as well. Uh, a, a Niagara Institute article uh, written in 2023 by someone named Michelle Bennett uh, actually called out learnings, uh, which uh, called out uh, some learnings about when um, leaders genuinely acknowledge their failures and short com com uh, their shortcomings. And one of the things that they found is that people are 7.5 times more likely to main maintain, uh, to have more trust uh, of, of those who, um, those leaders who genuinely acknowledge their failures or short shortcomings. That is huge. And, uh, you know, when I read that stat again, I, I uh, it really made me think of the leader that I just mentioned here. Um, he's somebody that I am happy to follow. But let's be real, we're not all going to be up on a, a public stage like that. Um, so what are some other ways that we can model humility to our teammates? Uh, the first thing is practice saying 
I don't know. And not going to lie, uh, that is really hard for me. Uh, but ask yourself that, you know, how well am I, how, how well do I uh, practice saying, I don't know, how comfortable do I feel about doing that? Uh, and be honest, you know, sometimes, uh, when, especially if you consider yourself a subject matter expert, it's really hard to feel like you don't have the answer for someone. Uh, but sometimes you just don't have the answer and that's okay. Another way to do this is by saying, or, or a way to kind of um, practice this is by, by uh, when you're in a meeting and maybe you're presenting something um, and you have some of your other colleagues that are working on the work with you and, and you can kind of close up a little bit of what you're saying and say, hey, you know, Joe or Gina, you know, hey, please keep me honest if I got any of that wrong or if I've missed anything. A shout out like this, again, models out the fact that it's okay to ask for help, that, you know, sometimes you might miss something. Uh, it also shows that you value your team's insight and knowledge. And more, moreover, beyond that, it, it also gives your teammate a chance to contribute. Uh, another way to practice humility is by inviting folks to disagree with you. Again, this can be very uncomfortable. And so sitting with the discomfort is something to work on uh, or that you can work on. And a simple way that you can start practicing this and incorporating this is, is simply, you know, in some of your meetings, if you have an idea or others have ideas is just to say something like, hey, you know, uh, this is really interesting concept, um, or however way you lead into that. Um, I'd love to kind of poke, poke some holes, you know, if, if it's your idea, help me poke some holes in that. Um, what am I missing? Uh, what are some of the things that we may not have considered? Uh, and invite, uh, be intentional about uh, inviting construct constructive disagreement. The other thing is ask for feedback. Oh boy, ask for feedback as much as possible, obviously within reason, but ask for feedback during your one-on-ones with your manager and ask for feedback uh, following the, uh, the completion of a major project or maybe if you do agile work uh, at the end of a program increment, which is basically a time box of when various bodies of work uh, get completed. Uh, in, in the Agile world, we call these retrospectives, and it's a really great way for people to share uh, some of the learnings of what went well, what didn't go well, and what are some of the ideas for how we can improve the next time around. Uh, so, so you're constantly learning. And speaking of learning, uh, keep learning. I mean, I think there's a saying, uh, always be learning or something like that. Uh, and I constantly learning and bringing back little nuggets to your teammates uh, is something that really helps everybody, uh, again, embrace the fact that, hey, we're all on a learning journey. We're never going to know everything. And uh, and this is a great way to share out um, some, some of that stuff with your, with your colleagues. Uh, partnering with your employee or business resource groups to create learning groups or forums and spaces where peers can help to lead discussions, uh, teach various skills that they, that they might be really solid on, um, and practice skills with one another in a really safe environment. You can also do this much more formally uh, as like a lunch and learn series, um, maybe a networking event where you curate some of the questions that might be presented or even like super formal, which is um, working with your talent development teams and creating some formal uh, leadership training events. And then last but not least, uh, always thank people. Uh, do not underestimate the power of expressing gratitude for others and, uh, and thanking them uh, for what they're doing. You can do this very simply as like a kudos or thank you call out during team meetings uh, or by creating a, a kudos team channel in Teams or Slack. There are, there are a, a number of different ways that you can do that. Uh, and, you know, there are some people who they appreciate recognition, but they don't necessarily want it to be called out in front of really large groups. And that's OK, too. Um, Typically, what, what can happen is uh, that actually happened to me one time where I had had done something where I was like giving a huge amount of praise in front of everybody. I was like making a big deal about it. And uh, the person came up to me later and they said, you know, I actually don't like that. And I was like, oh, 
I am so sorry. Um, and so my lesson learned was, you know, next time, uh, making sure that I, I didn't do that. And in that instance, you know, maybe I could have uh, created a better, established a better relationship with her from the get go, so that I would have known that that would have been a preferred method for her to receive uh, feedback. And then another great way of making a big impact with your kudos is by uh, emailing your coworker and CCing their manager. Uh, this actually takes your kudo or your thank you or your kudos to a whole other level because you're being very intentional uh, and you're being specific uh, with uh, providing visibility of your colleagues' work to their managers. And if their managers are doing a great job in terms of helping to elevate their folks, uh, they will bubble that up to their manager and across the organization, you know, on their peer level. So uh, doing something like that, it's a, it's a very easy tactic and it can have uh, big dividends. All right, so to sum things up for humility, uh, practice uh, saying, I don't know, you're modeling uh, courage and vulnerability. You're inviting others to disagree with you. Uh, you're asking for feedback. You're constantly learning and you're practicing gratitude and saying thank you. All right, so let's talk about ownership. Uh, in that last slide, we talked about how uh, instilling a sense of ownership is a byproduct of uh, humble leadership. And some of the other uh, benefits that get created when people feel a sense of ownership in, of their work and what they're doing is that they become more empowered, they gain a sense of responsibility, they become more committed and invested in their work, and they hold themselves and others accountable for delivering meaningful outcomes. The other thing that it does is that it gives people more autonomy and agency over their work. And that helps to create space uh, for them to learn and to grow and to establish a real sense of purpose in what they do. Uh, so again, kind of going back to that first part of the why. And since instilling a sense of ownership was also mentioned as that output of, of humility, a lot of what I mentioned uh, in that last slide uh, can be used to build this in your teams. And one of the things that I have found that really helps with instilling uh, a sense of ownership is to ensure clarity around roles, around responsibilities and expectations. And I know that this sounds very basic. It's kind of like a, yeah, that's kind of working 101, but it's really important to be intentional about that because uh, what that does is it helps to reduce ambiguity. And it also helps to establish boundaries and guardrails. Uh, I don't actually have a research stat on this, but I do think that people like to understand kind of their sandbox and they want to understand how how do how can I play within that? And then it helps them to figure out where are the areas where I can kind of bleed a little bit out of that sandbox and sandbox, and then where are the areas that are just hard nose. So um, being very intentional about this uh, with the roles, responsibilities, and setting expectations is really important. Additionally, I can't underscore the importance of delegation. As leaders, one of the things you, lear you learn, you know, is that you cannot do everything. You cannot be in the weeds of everything. Uh, you might go super fast, but you're not going to create scale of the work that you're doing. And, and you're certainly not going to be helping um, folks feel like they own anything because they're going to feel like you're micromanaging them. So when somebody is new to a team or an area of work that they haven't touched before and, and they need to get acclimated, uh, a good strategy is to help build confidence with small wins. And what you do here is, or what I've done in the past, is really starting first with teaching the mechanics of the work, uh, really uh, setting that, hey, this is what has to happen tactically in order for something to be achieved. And then once they understand kind of the mechanics of, of how to do stuff and get things moved forward, uh, then you can start to uh, progressively delegate the work out. First with some low stakes items that 
you know, don't have so much ex exposure, but it's kind of just giving them getting their feet wet. And then over time, progressively in increasing the delegation of work that you're giving them by size, by scope and, and by exposure until they've built a, a core competency of how to do it. And they've built uh, confidence in, in the work that they're doing. And then once you've done that, take a step back, right? Take a step back so others can step up. Uh, and I, I know it's been said before in other places when people do leadership sessions, but you know, leaders help others shine uh, and they are generous with their praise uh, and thanks, um, as I mentioned earlier. So a few things that will help you to step back and give folks uh, a little more control, if you will, um, and kind of take away some of that control that you feel like you have to have is to um, share information. Uh, share as much information as you can and be transparent um, if there's information that you can't. Uh, sometimes there's just info that cannot be shared and that's okay. But what people do not like is um, not having that communication of that uh, because it just kind of leaves them in limbo. And again, it, it creates ambiguity. And with ambiguity, people just start filling in the space um, with their own narrative. The other thing is don't hoard information or resources. Um, so again, what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to position them for success. So if they decide to leave the organization tomorrow or something happens and they have to be out for a long time, you can easily uh, come in the next day and help to pick things up and drive stuff forward. Uh, another great way uh, to help pave the way for stepping back is by identifying your teammates' motivation. And um, when it comes to like un understanding that, most people, I think what I have found is that they don't say, oh, I'm motivated by X, Y, Z. Um, it's a very deep thing that actually takes a lot of um, internal reflection. Um, but so like in terms of like trying to understand your teammates' motivation, one of the ways that you can do this is by building and nurturing your relationships. It is having those connections. It's spending time getting to know them outside of the workplace. Um, the, the WBRG leadership team does this actually by, by holding a monthly social. And in that monthly social, we don't talk about business. And I will tell you, I have had a hard time doing that sometimes. And, um, but when I do, I catch myself and I say, ah, like I'm breaking the norm here. Uh, and I stop myself, even if I'm like in mid thought and, you know, we all kind of laugh about it. We, we have a sense of, you know, humor and, and we can kind of laugh at ourselves and not take ourselves too seriously. Um, but it's really important to have some of that time uh, carved out and whether you're doing it in a larger group or whether you're doing it on a one, I want one-on-one. -on -one. And so, um, if you are in a hybrid or remote or in a hybrid type of environment in the office and you're going in, in the office, uh, I definitely encourage find at least one person that you can have a conversation with that's beyond just um, the meeting or a meeting, a work meeting that you have to do. The other thing that you can do, and, and then if you're in a remote environment, um, this is, again, another way that um, folks have really leveraged the WBRG because we have a large population of folks who are remote or who are hybrid, um, and but, you know, uh, maybe they can't join something in person. And um, and so they'll just join some of our uh, our networking events. And it's super low key. It's not not um, it's, nothing's mandatory, but like we find stuff to talk about that is um not anything tied to to the work. Um, and the reason that we can do that is we have other stuff that we curate out to provide that as um, an option for folks. So when you're building uh, and nurturing your relationships, uh, a tip that you can use to help foster that is find one personal thing that your teammate might share with you as you're having a conversation. And you know, really think about it. And after that meeting, kind of sit with it and think about different ways that you might be able to help that colleague um, further that one thing that, you know, of, is of interest of, to them. You know, maybe it's uh, making a connection. Maybe it's providing a resource. Uh, maybe it's, I don't know, it's like, hey, you know, I, I know that you like to do singing uh, and you actually sing professionally. Let me know when you're going to be in town because I'd love to see you perform. You know, those are things that I've 
that I have done. And I, I actually just had a conversation with a colleague the other day who, who does um, singing and uh, she's going to be coming to town, I think in the next month or so. And I'm like, Hey, that's a, it's going to be in town. It's going to be, you know, a hop, skip and a jump away from me. So, you know, let me put it in my calendar. So these sorts of things can serve as anchors for future conversations. And you can reference it when you're at a loss at, you know, with, with what to say at your next social gathering, or um, again, what you're doing is you are helping to cultivate this, this idea of getting to know the whole person um, that, you know, we're not just worker widgets. We are, we are whole people and we are, we are people who have interests and issues and, and all of that stuff outside of the workplace. And then the other thing is from a thinking about, you know, helping you to step back is really encouraging a test and learn mindset with your team. And so, you know, this is encouraging them to share their ideas. Uh, and one of the ways I've done that is, you know, you get to know them, you find what's kind of really important to them and what they can be passionate about. And then we talk about like, hey, let's let's research, research that a little bit, you know, go put something together, put a framework together. Uh, let's figure out what, what kind of effort it's going to be, like what we're trying to accomplish. And then um, and then help them with figuring out how to do a test and learn of that concept. Um, and so and when you're doing that, before you you do that test and learn and actually push anything out, you know, obviously what you're going to be doing is helping to set expectations with them of what's needed to be able to make an informed decision as to whether or not the idea that they're thinking about uh, is the right idea at the right time, because they might end up doing some of that um, that initial work and find that it doesn't actually make sense to pursue to pursue that yet. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then a final way to install uh, instill inner, uh, ownership is by intentionally saying to others, I trust your decision. I trust you. Um, it is an active way of, again, giving up control. And um, personally, as the employee, hearing that, uh, hearing that your leader trusts you and the decisions that you make uh, is fulfilling. Um, it conveys and, and and it conveys to you that they have confidence um, in your abilities. And so it helps to build the confidence um, muscle and push away any of that um, feeling that maybe, you know, you're not qualified or ready or prepared to, to do something. Um, ultimately, what you are building towards is an entrepreneurial mindset and an alignment of your team's work to your company's mission, vision, and strategy. And again, um, really helping them to kind of make it personal, right? In the sense of like having that connection and connect the dots between their own personal uh, why narrative. And when they do this, when, you know, things are just clicking and it's all going on all cylinders, um, they feel invested in the work that they're doing and they feel invested in one another. All right, so to sum up how to uh, instill ownership among your teammates, uh, clarify roles and responsibilities, um, set clear expectations, work on delegating, uh, encourage your folks um, to take things on, to test and learn, make sure you're stepping back so that they have space to do that and uh, convey trust and, and, uh, and actually say that. Um, that will go a long way. All right, leaders listen. So I'm gonna tell you this story here. Um, something happened to me, this actually happened a few years ago and I will never forget it. I was having a one-on-one -on -one with someone and ooh, it was a tough conversation. There was little that we agreed on and it is very obvious that we were uh, not talking uh, with one another. We were just kind of like ships in the night. We were just talking completely past uh, each other. And at one point I was uh, bringing up this concern that I had about something. And, you know, I thought it was pretty serious. And all of a sudden I just heard a bunch of other voices on the line, kind of like they, I don't know, had had uh, jumped on the line and, uh, and hijacked it or something. And I was like, what in the heck is going on here? And it turns out that that other person had... I guess a meeting conflict and they joined the other meeting while we were still in the middle of our call. Like I know schedules are crazy, but um, the, the, the guy thought that he could actually navigate 
um, both of these meetings at the same time. And uh, I just couldn't believe it. And you can imagine how I felt when that happened. Uh, it really made me feel like um, I was unimportant. And at our next meeting, I actually, I brought it up with him. I mean, I, I, I was so angry. Um, but, you know, I, before we had our meeting, I kind of like wrote down my thoughts. Um, and I reminded myself, like, here's what I am trying to accomplish. So that when I had a conversation with him, I could be very intentional about the way that I was approaching it. Um, so I, I brought it up with him. I mean, I laid it out, told him how it made me feel. I addressed, you know, the impact that it had on my um, desire to, you know, um, to, to work with him and to kind of follow whatever direction that he, maybe he was trying to, to lead us in. Uh, and I addressed the, the fact that I really did feel like we had a communications issue uh, in that, you know, we were, we had, we had a cycle of talking past one another. And so part of doing that was the idea of breaking the cycle, like interrupting the pattern that pops up. Did that resolve everything? No, uh, but it did get us on a path to think about how we were engaging with one another. And certainly for me, it it helped me to um, uh, just kind of naming it and naming the energy that came of it uh, helped me to be very intentional in how uh, I'd move forward in engaging with him uh, on a go forward basis. So again, I share that story to, to just reiterate the importance of listening and of being present and how it makes your colleagues feel when you're not. So there's a, a website called uh, uh, Gitnux, and it provides market trends and statistics and business data. And in 2023, they re released a report called the Active Listening Statistics and Trends Report. And they had a bunch of really interesting things about you know, the impact of active listening. And I just wanted to share a few of these uh, with you. And the first is that active listening improves employee satisfaction by 30%. Uh, active listening increased collaboration and productivity by up to 25%. And active listening reduces misunderstandings by 40%. And there's this other stat, it's a huge stat, it was like 80% of workplace conflicts were as a result of people miscommunicating with one another and not being able to communicate effectively. So active listening is a critical skill. And of all of the things that we are talking about in this concept of a, a whole approach to peer leadership, I actually think that uh, listening is probably the one of the most important ones. And honestly, uh, probably one of the ones that's hardest to master. It is a deliberate action, which takes into account what the other person is saying, uh, both verbally and non-verbally. It takes a lot of energy to actively listen. And full disclosure, this is something that I have to work out very, very hard with. Uh, and uh, truly, it's uh, something I have to work on really hard with with my 17-year-old kid. I've got three kids. And um, you, uh, for those of you who have teenagers, uh, you know what I mean. As But as a peer leader, you know, one of your jobs is, is to listen, to actively listen so that you can learn and be a more effective leader. Um, in, in being a thought partner with the folks that you're working with. So how can you practice listening? Uh, the first thing that I would say, and again, this is probably a, a Captain Obvious thing, is uh, be present, put your cell phone down, uh, stop multitasking. Uh, there have been numerous studies out there that show that 72% of employees feel pressured to multitask. and Honestly, I'm actually surprised that it's not higher than that because we are all so busy. We're juggling a lot. And then you interject to like just life. You know, it's there's a lot of balls in, that we are trying to juggle. Uh, but then further to the idea of multitasking, what they found is that only 2% of people can actually multitask effectively. So what does that tell you? It tells you, or at least it tells me, is that there are a whole lot of people out there who are multitasking uh, and they're terrible at it. So, um, be present. Uh, again, put that cell phone so cell phone down. Don't don't try to multitask. Uh, one of the rules that I have actually at home is you know like when we're having dinner uh, is is putting our cell phones away. Right, our cell phones are not important 
more important than the people that we're talking to. And if there is something that is really critical that, you know, it's, um you know, burning the bridge down type of critical issue that needs to be addressed, then just simply say, you know, hey, I'm sorry, I, I have to go. I, I I need to, you know, address this. Right. And it's just, just calling calling to that um, and then and then moving on. The other thing is a tip that I would give you is to leverage silence and silence can be very uncomfortable, um, but embrace it. Um, it's going to feel a little awkward, uh, but but wait, you know, it gets better uh, and uh, embrace embrace that silence. Oh, a suggestion that I would have for this is um, when you're talking with another person, try to wait at least five seconds after you stop speaking so that folks have a chance to digest what it is that you're saying and they have a chance to speak up. Sometimes it can take up to eight or 10 seconds. Uh, I lead a daily standup. You know, I will ask people before we wrap, hey, are there any questions? Um, you know, uh, and I will, I will intentionally pause. And again, it can kind of feel a little bit awkward because it seems like people are are not um, engaged, but but they just because they're not answering right away, it doesn't mean that they're not engaged. It just might be taking them time to again process and, and figure out, you know, what is the best way to move forward. Then when you're working and collaborating with folks and maybe you're responding to an idea or an issue or a concern, and maybe it's a it's really difficult and you're just kind of you know butting heads. Um, try the the tactic of rephrasing what the other person said and this is especially you know um effective when you might be uh, in a in some sort of disagreement and one of the ways that you can say you can do this is, is to simply say you know what i heard you say is and then share you know what you understood to have been what you understood as having been said and and do that in your own words and that last part is really key because if you're just kind of regurgitating what the person says, you may have heard it, yes, but you may not have necessarily understood what was being said and you might have missed something. So be very intentional about uh, about doing that. And then the last piece is, you know, being very intentional about not interrupting. I know that this is something that I have to work on really hard and uh, work on a lot. And it's not because like, I just want to, you know, I get so part of it is like I want to get my ideas out there, but the other part of it is, you know, I just want to show the person that I'm really engaged with what they're, what they're saying. So it's you know I'm I I want to demonstrate that I'm you know I'm not just kind of like uh hunting them, but you know this is one that um, it it really means a lot from when we when we think about uh, embracing diversity of thought and microaggressions. Uh, being very intentional about not interrupting and giving somebody the space to complete their thoughts is very, very important. So when you catch yourself doing that, try to stop yourself and say, oh, my my apologies, you know, please continue. Um, if you hear somebody else doing that, be an ally, interrupt that that behavior. And, and you can say something like, oh, hey, you know, Joe Schmo, uh, so-and-so, you know, was, was still, uh, completing her thought. Let, let's let her finish that. And then, you know, we'll pivot over to you, uh, cause we really want to hear what you have to say too. Right. Um, those are very effective ways of, of helping, um, and, and practicing this aspect of listening and helping and encouraging others to do the same. So to sum things up, uh, you can practice and model active listening by being present, putting down the phones and stop multitasking, leveraging silence, waiting five seconds, rephrasing things in your own words and, uh, and not interrupting. And I know we've got about 12 uh, minutes to go. So I'm gonna go fast on this last slide in case folks might have a, a questions. So the last part of this whole approach to peer leadership is, embracing things. And I kept this in, in, intentionally blank. Um, but the idea is, you know, embracing diversity, embracing change and ambiguity under, uh, under uh, uncertainty and discomfort, um, not being perfect. Uh, in many ways, kind of what we're talking about here is uh, giving ourselves and others grace, uh, because we're not always going to get it right. In fact, we're probably going to get it wrong more than we get it right. Uh, and being Having compassion and being empathetic of those around us. 
And each of the things that we talked about, if you're very intentional about working on those, you know, kind of one at a time, uh, they will serve as a really great layer of foundation to help you grow the muscle that you need to embrace um, so many things. And when you're thinking about this concept, you know, think about the energy that you're putting out in the earner, uh, in the universe and how you are bringing yourselves uh, to work. Uh, I went to this conference the other day and uh, one of the people who was doing the keynote did this amazing speech about energy. And one of the things that she shared was this idea of positive relational energy, which she defined as the uplifting, uplifting energy we feel when interacting with positive people. And so um, think about the energy that you are coming to work with every day. Like where is kind of your default? And when you are feeling that energy go down, you know, how can you, um, how can you um, change that energy and convert it into something that's positive and constructive? All right. Positive relational energy. Think about that. Think about the, that energy that you're putting out and how it, uh, how it relates to others. And uh, like I said, all of the things that we discussed earlier is going to help you to embrace that energy muscle, uh, muscle, um, so that you can, um, so you can, uh, you can, uh, embrace anything that comes your way. All right, there you have it. This is, uh, my kind of idea of the whole uh, approach or a concept for a, a whole approach to peer leadership. Uh, know your company's why, know your own why, make sure you align it with your own personal why narrative, stay humble, uh, make sure you own it, hold yourself accountable and find ways to instill this in your teammates. Uh, listen and learn and use that to help you as you lead and embrace it all, you know, uh, really harness that energy and, and put it to good work. So with that, I just want to thank you again for having me today. I hope that you enjoyed this um, presentation and that there's stuff there that resonated with you and hopefully gave you some different ideas. You know, maybe there's not necessarily new concepts, but hopefully it makes you think about the way you're approaching stuff and, uh, and, and can use that to help you lead and inspire others. Uh, I always love swapping ideas with people and I love learning from others on how to be a better leader and really just learning in general. So, you know, if you'd like to reach out to me uh, on LinkedIn, I would love to connect and get to know you and, um, yeah, let's be awesome peer leaders to one another. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, we have a few moments for uh, questions. If anyone has a question that comes in the chat, I know one popped up in a personal private message. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to share if you or share the question. Uh, do you have any tips or tricks uh, just about leveraging uh, mentorships? Leveraging mentorships. Oh, um, Yes. Let me kind of think about this a little bit um, in terms of like making sure that. You, so, yes. Um, sorry, I'm just kind of thinking about the question a little bit because there are so many different ways that you can leverage the mentorship, you know, one of which is to get a better understanding of the company and the culture, how to navigate in your company. Uh, the other is uh, levering, re leveraging your mentors um, to help them help them convert them to become sponsors of your work and to help you to connect them with folks who could be sponsors in your work. And one of the things that I have done with my mentors is I've actually just flat out said to them, I need your men I need your sponsorship. I love the ideas um, that you are giving me. I appreciate it. Um, I, you know, one of the ways that I'll do it is, you know, I'll bounce ideas off of them um, so that, you know, and getting their feedback. So like, that's another way of leveraging uh, a mentor is, you know, actually it's really kind of good, a great practice um, to find a mentor that is not actually in your sphere of area of work because they will have a very different view um, and they can be, um, they can be really um, um not agnostic, that's not the word, impartial. Uh, and it's almost kind of like a, you can use your mentors and create like a board of directors. I know a lot of people do that that concept, the idea of creating a board of directors. But, you know, it's be very intentional. I would say, again, intentional is a theme. Be intentional about the people that you reach out to, to be your mentor. 
Um, think about the purpose that their mentorship will have for you and what you're hoping to get out of them. And what are things that you can do to help benefit them? Because the mentorship is bi-directional. It's not just about you, right? So you, a way of leveraging mentors is to make sure that um, you're helping them uh, in the work that they are doing, making connections, finding, finding, um, helping to solve so uh, solve problems, things of that nature. That may hopefully that wasn't too rambly. I hope that helped in answer. No, that was wonderful. And then we had another question come through. Okay, perfect. How often is it okay to say I don't know before it comes off as being incompetent? Don't we want to instill confidence in those we're leading so they know they can come to us with anything? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this. Uh, you're right. Whoever asked the question, it's not like you're going to be like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. In every, every single meeting, um, that's not realistic. However, there are instances and you can space it out. Like this is something that I've, uh, I will do. Like sometimes, especially if it's something that is new to you and maybe you're just taking over something that is a time to, to, to say, to, to put it out there. Hey, I'm new on this project. Um, I may have missed something, you know, that's a kind of a natural way to, to bring that in. Sometimes maybe that's when you're, when, let's say you're, you have positional authority and you're leading a team and it's a brand new team. You know, I, we've had some, some uh, team changes where I work and, you know, I don't really know uh, the director or the VP of my department. And, you know, he, he, one of the things that he's done is holding uh, a team meeting with his kind of group of cohorts. And one of the first things he said is, hey, we're a new team. I get it. I don't know you. Um, and there's work that you may be doing that I have not had exposure to. Uh, and I'm, I don't know everything. So, you know, I really appreciate your insights. And we're going to, we're going to, there's going to be some stuff that, you know, honestly is really ambiguous. And I just don't have an answer for you. But, what I will do is as soon as I do have an answer for you, you can be sure that I will bring it back. So even if you are formally leading the team, that is one way that you can do that while still in, uh, instilling confidence in other folks. Hope that, hope that helps. Perfect. Yes. Thank you so much. And I don't see any other questions really coming through. We'll hold on for another moment. Just a lot of thank yous. I know my <laughs> notebook is completely full and I'm actually going to steal the, I'm going to allow for a minimum of five seconds, but I'm really going to try and push myself to eight after I am done sharing an idea or anything like that, really giving people uh, an opportunity to share their feedback. Um, and just so everyone knows that the recording will be, I'll be working on getting it up tomorrow on our YouTube page, and I will be sending out the link after um, tomorrow once it is up and live so you can watch and potentially even share with your team or others. Uh, but oh. thank you, everyone. Um, I don't see any more questions coming through, so I'll, we'll just give you a couple moments back on your <laughs> lunch break. But until next time, friends. Thanks again, everybody. Really appreciate it. I'd love to reach out to you. So connect with me. Take care.